the death of global competition, realistic or wishful thinking? We're going to find out here coming up. The interview with author Geshe Michael Roach and the death of global competition. Don't go anywhere. This is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. Welcome back to another edition of Book Circle Online. I'm your host, Katerina Kazayas. It is a pleasure to be here with you. As always, we have a riveting guest. You're going to want to stay tuned for this episode because we are going to be talking about the very timely conversation, global competition, between the two superpowers of today, America and China. Before we get started, uh, a reminder that you can catch up with me anytime. Katerina Kazayas, your host, at Katerina Kazayas, that's both for Twitter and Instagram. You can also catch me on my website, globalgab.com, that's global-gab.com, where I fill you in on top trending international issues and analysis. Part of all that is going to flow into today's conversation with our good friend, author, and Tibetan Buddhist monk, Geshe Michael Roach. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here with us. I received an advanced copy of your book, The Death mm -hmm. of Global Competition, mm -hmm. China Love You. And it is a book that you have written together in collaboration with Dr. Eric Wu. Would you explain to us a little bit about the premise of the book and what prompted you today to write it? Uh, well, I spent 25 years in a Tibetan Buddhist monastery. Mm. And uh, before that, I attended Princeton University. Okay. And uh, when I was finishing my Geshe degree, uh, which takes 25 years, mm. As the final examination, a thousand different monks ask you questions. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, in Tibetan. And uh, then you have to respond uh, from mm -hmm. memory. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I finished, I was the first uh, Westerner in, in 600 years at my monastery. And then. Uh, that was the uh, Sierra Monastery in Tibet. Yeah. Right, wow. And uh, one of my lamas uh, challenged me and he said, Well, you know, you're the first Westerner. And we've taught you all these things about tweaking the future and mm -hmm. changing the future. So he said, we want, with you, we want to test you. Oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> we want to do an experiment in New York City. And we want you to go to New York and start a business uh, based on the principles that we taught you. So here you are after 25 years of becoming a, a Tibetan Buddhist monk. You think you're going to now relax into your state of beingness, and you're asked to go instead and start a business in New York. Yeah, and it was how, a little how fascinating. <laughs> it was a little tense because I, you know, I went to the monastery because I wanted to be in a monastery. Sure, and right. He was pushing me to, to go start a business and see if I could use the principles that they mm. taught me in the real world. Mm. And at the time, I was sort of almost angry, yes. uh, but then in the end, I thought, oh, this was a really a good idea. So I went to New York, and I had no money at all. I had $7. I didn't have any Western clothes. I, I went to Goodwill. I bought some a oh used wow. suit. And uh, I helped start a diamond business. We started with mm -hmm. three people. And uh, now that's about 10,000 people there. Okay. And we reached $250 million a year. And in 2009, the company was bought by Warren Buffett. I, I had read exactly that. I had read that you started this business with a $50,000 loan with nothing. Yeah. You grew it to a $250 million in sales business, sold it to Warren Buffett, and, and the premise behind the company was to help Tibetan refugees. Is yeah, that correct? My, my goal in the company was to test the principles that I had learned and see if they would work in the real world. And what were those principles? What, what, what are some of those examples? Uh, I think it's a very interesting idea that the world is coming from you. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then if you can tweak the source of that, then you could make a $250 million company or you could change the globe. And they always teach it with a pen. So I'll give okay. you this little Give thing. us the pen example, absolutely. Uh, they will ask, this is a 2,000-year-old system of teaching how the world comes from you. So first they will, and they will ask questions. So they'll say, what is this thing? Okay, I think it's a pen. Yeah, and then sure. they'll say, if a little dog came in here and he ran up on here and I showed it to him and I, you know, a puppy, then what would he do with it? Probably chew it. Yeah, <laughs> he would chew it. I don't think he would use it as yeah. a pen. Yeah, and right. then the next question is, does the dog see it as a pen? And we'd say no. No. They see the same black stick, but mm. they don't see it as a pen. They see it as something to chew. And the next question the Lama will ask you is, who's correct, mm. the dog or the human? 
Mm. Well, I think both. Yeah, that's right? a good answer. Yeah, right. I mean, that's valid. The dog can chew on it. Absolutely, the that's, that's the dog's perception of what that is, yeah, right? No problem. And really, it's a piece of plastic painted black. Yeah, and the human can write with it, and sure. there's no contradiction. Then the next question is beautiful because mm. they'll put the pen on the table, and they'll say, if the humans left the room, and all the dogs left the room, then at that time, what is it? Is it a pen, or <laughs> is it something to chew? I'd what say probably think? neither at that yeah, point. Yeah, we say, we right. go like this and we say nothing. Sure. And that's the Buddhist idea of emptiness. Okay. And if you understand it, uh, you can make a $250 million company. Okay. So how it works is uh, we would ask somebody, is the pen coming from you? Or is the pen, say, uh, say someone comes back in the room and they look at this thing on the table, mm. then at that moment it becomes a... A pen. Again. Yes, right. And is that pen coming from you or is it coming from the pen? I mean, the answer to that, given your explanation, would be that that's coming from me. Yeah. I'm the one making it the pen. Yeah, nice, because when I walk in, it becomes a pen sure, again. Sure, absolutely. But for the dog, it's... So it's you can really take this premise then and use it with anything. Yeah, so the idea is, why do I see a pen? Is that we say there's a seed in your mind. Okay. And when it opens, a small image of a pen comes out, like about this big, made of light. And your mind throws it onto this object within a, a, a 65th of a second. Hmm. So that's why I see a pen and that's why the dog sees a stick to mm -hmm. chew on. Mm -hmm. If I knew how to plant those seeds, then I could change my future. I could adjust how much money my company makes. So. And, and you do talk about a little bit of that in the book. You have a mm -hmm. seed theory how yeah. to plant seeds, and it's a four-step process, yeah. which, uh, to be very honest with you, I had to read twice. Yeah, yeah. Because it, uh, you explain it very well, mm -hmm. but the philosophy behind that, uh, it makes me feel better now that you say that you took 25 years to, to, yeah, yeah. to really <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> delve into this, because I needed more than 25 minutes. But um, if you could learn how to plant those seeds, sure. you could control what happens to you next year. And so part of the premise of the book, then, is to take these two global superpowers and have them cooperate to plant these seeds of yeah, cooperation versus competition? Yeah, first we have to talk about how is it that you plant a seed. How is so it that you plant a seed? For example, if I want to make a new business, uh -huh. like I did, then there are four ancient steps to, to starting a business. Number one is you decide what would you like to do. Some people would like a lot of money. Some people would like to have a beautiful relationship. Some people would like to improve their health. Some people would like to have a peaceful mind. Okay. Some people would like to see world peace. Those are like five great goals of everyone shares. Mm. So what? first you define what would you like to work on first. Okay, so set your intention. Yeah, right. what, so what, you what say, what I want to start a successful on? business to okay. help the refugees. All right. And then secondly, the second step is you must find another person who wants something similar. Mm. Uh, you must choose someone from your friends or family or people you know and who wants something similar. So maybe find someone who's thinking to start a business. Okay. Third step, you have to spend one hour a week helping them. And as Now, they don't have to be in your same business. You don't start the business no. together, just someone else in a similar state. Yeah. Okay. And then I'll give you an mm. example. We often do this when we travel around the world. We, 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 we teach this to about 20,000 people a year. Okay. I feel and I feel privileged to be getting it live. Thank you very much. We often use I'm a hundred listening. dollar bill. Okay. Are you giving them away? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we'll take a hundred dollar bill and we'll see how a seed is planted in your mind. Hmm. Uh, and it's very interesting. So I find a person who wants to make some money, and I would like to turn this hundred dollars into a thousand dollars. Okay. So I need to plant a seed, and the third step is that I must do something good for you to help you make money, and that will plant a seed in my mind. So I want to show you how it works. So you have to hold your hand out. Then I, I put this in your hand, and I close your hand. And when I let go mm -hmm. with my hand, m I see my hand open. Mm -hmm. And that image of my hand opening comes through my eyes, and it, it brushes my brain. It touches my brain, and it makes an impression on my brain. Okay. And then in three or four hours, that impression becomes a seed below the subconscious. And mm -hmm. that seed, by the nature of all seeds, even in nature, it, it doubles every 24 hours. The, the weight of it oh, wow. uh, doubles every 24 hours. So by the time the seed opens, I will make $1,000 easily. 
and so I'm really giving it to you. <laughs> and no, because I I I use this system to make a, well, you know, it's the largest jewelry company in the world now. Uh, clearly, uh, you you are doing something well now. Yeah. Just so that I understand this, if I then in turn accepted this, which yeah. I will <laughs> gladly accept, thank you. <laughs> uh, nice. But uh, but if I take this and I then do something similar to someone else and I give them. Uh, this hundred dollars, or yeah. perhaps I wait for my thousand and give. Uh, I suppose I have to yeah. give it to them first, yeah. release, yeah. and wait for it. So is that part of what karma is about then? Then you can call it karma. You can call it a seed. It's the same thing. Okay. But I think the word karma is so abused right. that I the ancient word is seed. Okay. So that image of helping you, or when I hear myself speaking to you and explaining something to you, it it makes an impression on my brain. And then that becomes a seed. And if I know how to take care of that seed, mm. it will open into great wealth. It's very interesting that you say that because I, I heard something recently, and I, I, I am upset with myself that I don't remember who the source was, but it was something along the lines of your significance is what you deposit into the world. Your success is what you get out of it. And you see that example with your business, with somebody like Oprah Winfrey and all of the good that she's done, with people like Tony Robbins, with people like jo Steve Jobs. They are continuously adding value and applying these principles. And the wealth that they have received because of that has been a hundredfold, thousandfold. I think if you understand the process clearly, then you, you can have more trust in it and you can get farther with it. And I think what often happens, those first three steps, deciding what you want, choosing another person who wants the same thing, and then helping, helping them. them to get it. Those plant the seed, but those seeds can stay in your mind for many years without opening. Okay. So we say the fourth step is the most important. What is the fourth step? And uh, that's a, a meditation that you do just before you go to sleep, because your mind is very open just before you sleep. Mm. And all night long, your mind is open like a flower. And just light impressions that you plant just before you sleep, they, they cook all night and they circle in your mind all night. So just before you go to sleep, on your pillow, and you know, just laying down, yeah. not with your legs crossed, right, right. Uh, just you just think about the nice thing you did for the other person. Hmm. And when you think about a seed, it, it actually causes it to open faster and more strong. So, so al almost by your thought, the conscious effort of thought is sort of like watering the seed. Exactly. And the appreciation of what you did, mm. appreciating yourself mm. and the good thing you did, it causes the seed to open faster. And, and I think most people have an instinct that to be kind to others is going to make me successful, but they don't realize that being happy about the good things you're doing mm. makes it open faster. So that's the big key, you know, that people right. need to learn. And can, can you really, I mean, you know, my, I would have challenged you just now and said, can you really use these philosophies to build a successful business? But you have done just that. Yeah, several times. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a new business. We're, we're in many countries, 20 countries, mm -hmm. I think um, 70, 75 cities. We've, we have organizations there and it's going very well. So I, I really like to share this with people because mm -hmm. everyone I know who's tried it has become very successful. I was in China oh. one day, and a woman raised her hand. I was speaking to a big business audience, and okay. she said, um, I don't need money. I have a big business. It's going very well. But I have another question, mm. which is... Uh, what did she need? You know, I've been married for 30 years. I've been cooking every night for my husband. Not only has he never cooked for me, but he never washed the dishes once. Is there a way to plant a seed to make my husband wash the dishes? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I... You know, I was rushing in my mind. I was thinking, they didn't teach me this in the <laughs> monastery. But uh, we worked it out. And uh, of course, she did these same four steps. Okay. And, and recently, she invited me to her home, and her husband was cooking dinner. <laughs> and she laughed, and she said, and it, it wow. worked. So you can use okay, it for many for things. For many things. And uh, mm. then I, you know, I, uh, the first time I went to China, I was very nervous. I had heard a lot of negative things. I remember I was at my dentist, and he said, where are you going next? And I said, China. And he said, oh, be careful. Mm -hmm. You know, they're very rough people and, and very, you know. And I was nervous, and I went there and... and uh, you know, it's interesting because China, I think, for an American, is, is the, the furthest possible cultural gap. It is, and so yeah. we do have this feeling of, oh, China, wow, that's just different. And, and so you went for the first time. What did you find? 
Well, I think we're afraid of China. And, uh, they Why? Have Why are people afraid of China? Well, they've gone from zero. Mm -hmm. You know, I was there in the early days. There in Beijing, it was all bicycles. Mm -hmm. There were no cars. Now they have uh, 500,000 new cars a year or something, and it's, it's unbelievable. You can't see a car older than a year old. And I, I think a few things. One, we in the West really must commend China for the magnificent turnaround that they've made in such a short span of time. And to your point, I started visiting China. I've been many times as well. And the first time I was there was not, not too long ago. It was about eight years ago. I think it was 2009, mm -hmm. 2008, 2009. And uh, we were g taking the ferry boat from Hong Kong across to mm -hmm. Zhuhai, which is just across the pond. And the, the port was, you know, it was a little shack. And, <laughs> uh, you know, it was set up five years later. The whole thing was electronic. There was a KFC in there. <laughs> it was, it was, you know, it was it, the, the, the logistics behind this port entry, entry point blew anything that I've seen in North America away. Yeah. And that was within five years in one tiny port. Uh, so th they, they really are making strides. How do we in the West work with China, though? Because th this is the thing, just to put this in perspective for our viewers who may not be as familiar with China. Mm -hmm. China has almost four times the population of the USA. Exactly. So 320 million in the US versus almost 1.4 in China. The other thing, and you mentioned this in the book, and I had never thought of this rationally, the United States borders two countries, Canada to the north mm -hmm. and Mexico to the south. China borders 14. Yeah. China has managed, maybe except for this, you know, little rifts with Tibet, mm -hmm. has managed to stay peaceful mm -hmm. with 14 nations on its borders. We have to be able to learn from this example. Well, they've been, you know, this idea of the four steps comes from, uh, we took it from the Diamond Cutter Sutra, which is mm -hmm. the oldest book in the world, mm -hmm. oldest printed book and the Chinese copy is the oldest printed book in the world. So they've been mm -hmm. feeding off these ideas for, you know, thousands of years. And this is ingrained in their culture. Yeah, okay. and uh, I think America, we have this, anytime someone comes up to equal you, say in your job mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. with your relationship, then you feel jealous or you feel threatened. Yeah, you feel the competition, right? Yeah, and you don't like it, and it feels mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had, uh, I, g I gave a talk in Florida to a large group of uh, architects, mm -hmm. uh, 1,400 architects, and uh, they were, we were discussing the question mm -hmm. of what to do. Uh, China wanted to buy an American oil company. Mm -hmm. And this is a very typical move. And uh, mm -hmm. the Congress took oh. up this question of whether we should allow China to buy an American oil company or not. So I taught them for an hour and a half the four steps, and we discussed where things come from. Okay. And then I said, well, what's the way for America to assure its oil supplies for the future? You know, what's the way for America to ensure energy in the future, according to this theory, you know, whether it's true or not, we sure. can discuss. Uh, according to your theory, if I'm learning it correctly, yeah, would be that we should sell an oil company to China. And it's the only way to get more energy. Oh, that's so counterintuitive, <laughs> though, <laughs> yeah, yeah, to, no. to my brain. But it's very, uh, it's been taught in all the great religions of history that mm. what you want, you should do for another. Mm. And, and But when it comes down to an oil company, we, we <laughs> hesitate <laughs> and we feel nervous. And, and that gets into the question of, where does oil come from? You know, and, and in this system, it's just like the pen. Oil supplies in America, mm -hmm. energy supplies, are actually coming from seeds in your mind. So if you want more, mm -hmm. you must help other countries to get more energy. You don't have a choice. Now, again, I'm just going to try to look at this from the perspective of a viewer right now. Yeah. The energy supply is a physical energy supply, is it not? We tap into the ground, the oil sprouts out, we get it. So how can it be also in my mind? Well, it's an interesting question, you know, and, and, and this talk was a few years back. Okay. And by the end of the talk, yeah. these guys in Florida, who were very conservative, they agreed wow. that we should sell <laughs> the oil company they in order to get more energy supplies for America. And and the question is, if it's true about a pen, mm -hmm. it's not less true mm. for oil supplies. And what's, I'll tell you something interesting. After we had this meeting, and we even talked to some legislators about it, okay. and uh, suddenly new supplies of oil appeared in the United States. And now the U.S. is the largest producer of oil in the world. Uh, how did the U.S. 
from having right. oil shortages. Sure, I mean, it was behind Venezuela, it was behind Saudi yeah. Arabia, it no, was way behind. behind. Right. Yeah. And then suddenly, because of the fracking, uh, yeah. we, mm. we have outproduced, we are outproducing mm. Saudi Arabia. We are the largest exporter of oil in the world. Why did it happen? Now, we didn't sell an oil company to China, or did we? Well, we, we have did, not yet. But it's the intention okay. uh, is the most important thing. Mm. So, so when you talk about competition between the U.S. and China, so now there are two superpowers yes. in the world, and we have a choice. We can try to block them. We can see them as competition. And, and what's natural, what's human nature, is to keep what's yours. And right. to try to block someone who's coming up close to you, mm. who's, who might surpass you. Mm -hmm. And human nature is to compete and to try to push the, the Super Bowl right, mentality, mentality right, of, absolutely. of our country. Yeah, there can only be one winner. And we, right. have to, we have to go faster and harder than China. And, and, and wherever possible, we should block them. Mm. But in this, in this theory, the world is coming from seeds in your mind which are planted by helping the competition, you see. So then if people can grasp this mm. new idea of where things come from, then the in the new world, you know, instead of a Cold War, yeah. which is how it's shaping up now, it looks like it's going to be a Cold War. Well, you know? I, I was going to say, how much of the philosophy that you're promoting is going to get a bit of a kink in it now with the new political landscape we're moving <laughs> into, right? Because yeah. um, I, I think that the president that we have elected yeah. uh, is coming from very much a competitive frame of mind. Yeah, and the idea of uh, blocking right. uh, imports. And the closed border mentality. And we're yeah. seeing, and actually we're seeing this happening around the world right now. Yeah. We saw it with Brexit. Yeah. We're seeing it in a lot of the other uh, Western countries France is in Europe. about to go this way. Absolutely. And we yeah. saw it a, as an example with this election and the way America yeah. voted. So how do we take, because really what you have right now is the superpower of America, mm -hmm. the superpower of China, and two very different business philosophies. They're both extending outwards, and you know, as you say in the book, at one point they will crash into each other. Conflict is almost inevitable. Right, if we don't figure out a way to work in a way that benefits everyone. Yeah, and that's why we wrote the book. You know, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Wu, who's my uh, co-author. Yes. Uh, he's a he's a pretty famous Chinese businessman, and, and I thought, you know, there's a time when citizens of the world, uh, mm. maybe in the business realm, mm. we should stand up and say we work together and we help each other and we try to make each other successful and because of that he and I have both been extremely successful and you know our businesses are going crazy mm -hmm. like great, great. hundreds of millions of dollars are <laughs> flying around and uh, you know the point is th that, that I thought that we thought that if two business people one from China one from America mm -hmm. if, if we could work together for many years on the basis of this new philosophy, which comes from his country. Mm -hmm. uh, which really isn't new. It's a 5,000-year-old philosophy. Yeah, yeah. It's new to <laughs> us, right? Well, and Absolutely. he's used it his whole life. And then, you know, mm. life brought us together. Mm. I've used it for, I don't know, 25 years. And it was very beautiful that life brought us together. And, and we both believe in, in this system that what you do to others mm. determines how prosperous you are. So I think it was very exciting that we did a book together. The I gave a talk about uh, this idea in China okay. to a group of Chinese. And uh, this man went to the bathroom and he came back and he had a toilet roll. A toilet uh, paper roll? The yeah. cardboard. Okay. <laughs> and he had written on it, China love you. Uh, in, in his limited sh English. Shaky oh. letters, yeah. yeah. And he very honorably presented me with this toilet uh, paper roll. And I thought that would make a great name for the <laughs> book. You know, uh, it, 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 it's, a d it's a different culture. And, uh, and, and, you know, part of the reason that they think differently and, and that they act differently is, again, they come from a country with so many people. Yeah. And so one of the, the things that you touch on, one of the themes in the book, is individualism versus groupism. I think it's one of the main points that we might have conflict in the future. Okay. How so? Uh, because the Chinese philosophy is one of family and mm -hmm. one of groups. So you you stick with, with the, the welfare of the group mm -hmm. and you're not supposed to be individualistic. Like you're not supposed to break out of the norms of the group mm -hmm. to get what you want. You have to sort of 
do what's best for the group. Uh -huh. And in America, you know, in a typical movie, right. uh, the guy yeah. is individualistic and he disobeys his superiors right, and, and he and wins the war and yeah, it goes out in Terminator. I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. do it on my own. <laughs> yeah. So how do you, how are you gonna deal with the world when these two huge philosophies, one of the individual mm -hmm. and one of the group, when they smash into each other like the Titanic hitting an iceberg? You know what's going to happen, and and how can we prevent uh, problems coming up when these th these two mm -hmm. worldviews are going to crash into each other? And 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 your response to that is to try and promote this four seed thought philosophy. Well, it's kind of like you can have your cake and eat it too. Can you though? Uh, yeah, because uh, as an individual, you must serve another individual mm -hmm. to get what you want, and that's a group. You see what I mean? Okay. So. In a way, to be the ultimate individual, uh, you must serve another individual. There's a deeper theory here. Okay. Uh, so personally, I like donuts. Okay. And every country I go to, I go to 20-something They countries like donuts too? Well, I, every country <laughs> has their own donuts. And uh, so I really love them. And then in this theory, it's very interesting. If I want more donuts, then I should try to make sure that Katarina gets a lot of donuts. You know, like... Hmm. My mouth is over here. Okay, right, right. Your mouth is over there. And I'm going to give you my donuts? For me to get an assured future supply of donuts, yeah. just like oil supplies, yeah. then I must put donuts into your mouth, you see? So visually, your mouth is over there, mm -hmm. my mouth is over here. But functionally, uh, your mouth is connected to my mouth. I, c I can't get donuts unless I see that you get donuts in your mouth. So mm -hmm. functionally, we might be one person, mm. you see, functionally, not visually. We're sure, separated by right, right, yeah, the uh, some three physical feet. form here, right? Yeah, but functionally, I can't get what I want unless I give you what you want. That means that you are sort of me, and then that's where the group comes in. You see what I mean? So for the individual, the rugged, individualistic American to get what they want. They must do something for another individual, mm. and and so. And one thing I think we need to remember is that um, America is a country that is two hundred years old. Yeah. China is is a society, is a culture that is five thousand years old. Yeah. They have managed to live through so many times that I think there has to be some some real respect that we need to pay to this culture. To help anyone out here, in addition to. Uh, the Death of Global Competition, which is your most recent book. Mm -hmm. You also wrote a book that was based on the Diamond Kama Sutra philosophies, and it's called The Diamond Cutter. I see you have brought a copy with uh, you. Would you pass that to me for just a moment? Yeah. I just I want to point it out. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is another one of um, Geshe Michael's books that I haven't read, but I'm looking yeah. forward to reading, especially based off of our conversations today. And this, I, I presume, outlines this philosophy in a way that Westerners can appreciate? I, I've written about, uh, I have a selection of like say five different books uh, written over the past years. Mm -hmm. So this Diamond Cutter book, which is a bestseller all over the world, sure. it's in 40 languages I think, mm -hmm. um, millions of copies. This one is a great one if you want to start a business. Okay. Or you want to be successful in your career. Mm -hmm. And then uh, because people have asked me how do you apply it to your husband. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I wrote, wrote this book. This book is called The Karma of Love. The Karma of Love, 100 Answers for Your Relationship. This is probably also, in, in saying bestseller on the cover, uh, another one that crosses all national geographical borders because, like you said, relationships are something that are intrinsic to human nature it's and human need. It's very popular all over the world. And it's how to use these four steps in mm -hmm. your own relationships, whether it's a business relationship or your personal relationships. And then for your health, mm -hmm. Uh, there's a book based on the Yoga Sutra, which is called How Yoga Works. And do you do yoga? I do yoga every day for about 20 years. Okay. And uh, what do you find it brings to your life? I'm healthy, and uh, I'm not overweight. I was overweight <laughs> before that, and uh, it helps me to think clearly. Like before mm -hmm. I go on a TV show, mm -hmm. I might do some yoga. So I I don't like physically exercising. I don't like it. Okay. But I do it because I want to be healthy. Um, the book is called How Yoga Works. Yeah. And, uh, and again, um, I'm sure this is popular in the yoga community. That one, no, it went crazy all over the United States. I think it's number 4,000 on Amazon. Wow. And, uh, it's like crazy. And uh, <laughs> 
it was just an accident. <laughs> now the thing is, you know, and, and again, yoga is yeah. something that has really hit mainstream USA the last 20 years, I'd yeah. say. It's, it's a physical practice, but there's also a spiritual element to it. Yeah. How much do you uh, focus on turning your mind off as you're doing some of these poses? And I'm not a yogi, I should start, <laughs> but. You should start. I should start. Uh, it's good when you hit a certain edge to do that. <laughs> um, I hear it's I good for your joints as well. It's not as hard as uh, jogging on pavement. Well, you know, in the ancient yoga, this book is a, n a novel, mm -hmm. and it's being made into a Hollywood movie. Oh, uh, oh lovely. Based on on the yoga principles, which are exactly the same. So mm -hmm. if I want to be healthy, if I want yoga, so two people walk into a yoga class. Uh, one person hurts their neck in the yoga class, and <laughs> that's why they have these uh, <laughs> restorative yoga classes <laughs> for people who hurt themselves during In the yoga. main yoga class. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and they charge you both times. <laughs> uh, and then the second person gets thin and feels strong and healthy and, mm -hmm. and the difference, according to this theory, is that one person has been serving the sick in the past, and the other person has ignored the sick in the past. So if I've been serving friends or family who've been ill... You won't get sick. I, I make seeds in my mind that when I walk into a yoga class, I get thin and strong. Mm. And this, the same class, a different person walks in who has ignored sick people, and they hurt their neck in the yoga class. So that's, that explains why the same yoga exercises work for some people and don't work for other people. There are deeper causes mm. of why things happen. Then this is a book about meditation mm. and how to do meditation. So you really have, the book about meditation is called The Garden. It's a parable, uh, mm -hmm. again, by uh, Geshe Michael. Right. You really have, between all of these books, covered the gamut of yeah. health, mind, relationships, yeah. uh, and, uh, and International economics. International politics. <laughs> yes, abs absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm, that's the idea, is, to, is that you can apply this idea that the world is coming from seeds in your mind. You can apply it to every class of now, now, what about this? We have been introduced to some Eastern philosophies with yoga, with meditation, and, and some of these. Uh, but the Eastern, the Eastern culture has also been introduced to, to Western mm -hmm. um, things, such as the onslaught of fast food. Mm -hmm, yeah. and, and again, this is another thing that I saw over my course of traveling to China um, for almost 10 years. When I first arrived, there was very little Western influence. I mean, the Hong Kong and, and Shanghai, perhaps, uh, but in mainland China. And now you will go and on the street corner, you'll find Starbucks, and you'll find you know some of these Western uh, chains. But what I also started finding is that the people there, because they were eating and drinking this Western food with the high sugar content, the high food content, I would go back after six or twelve months, and they would have gained ten pounds. Yeah. So this has got to be a concern from the East. This is a strange thing that, you see, in China, uh, eating a lot of greens and not eating a lot of meat and not eating a lot of high oily foods right. uh, has been the norm for thousands of years. And then recently, uh, McDonald's has come in with about 5,000 units. Yeah. Uh, KFC is there for, with 5,000 units. Mm -hmm. 10,000 uh, fast food joints have opened in China. And I, I visit China frequently, mm -hmm. and I can see their health is suffering yes. from this uh, sort of cultural pollution from the West. So I think, I think it's Americans have to be aware that people in the world, they copy us. Mm. What they see, they love our movies, uh, they love our rock and roll, there's nothing like it in the world. Yeah. And they will copy what we do. So if they see Americans eating this uh, high fat food, mm -hmm. uh, then they will also try it and then they will get addicted to it. You talk in the book about the, the visible hand versus the invisible hand. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about that for our viewers? Yeah, this is a question of, say, whether the federal government should control policies like birth control. Mm -hmm. So in China, because of the emphasis on the group, uh, to have the visible hand, which means the government steps in and says, we have too many people, we're going to ask people to limit themselves to one child each. And then to an American, this feels very wrong. Very intrusive. Uh, Why are you in yeah, my bedroom? Right? Very much against their, uh, their national individualism. Mm -hmm. But in China, if people had twice as many children, they would have had another 350 million people in the time since that policy was instituted. Wow. So the equal to the population of the U.S. If in just one generation, really. Yeah, and if they had had one more child each. So they, they the government, mm -hmm 
And the people in China feel that, okay, well, if the they see the government like their father or something, mm -hmm. and they think if the government makes a decision like that, then they'll follow it. Uh, not because they feel coerced or threatened or something like that, but just that over thousands of years, in a small country which is has much less farmland than the U.S., that if they don't work together, mm -hmm. they will be destroyed. They will destroy themselves. Well, and, and China has, um, you know, very similar land mass to the USA, yeah. but it has about 50 percent of the fertile land. Yeah. Uh, so that's a very good point that you make. Yeah. Uh, we are, though, as a globe, um, <laughs> drastically increasing in population. Yeah. Projections by the middle of the century, by 2050, is going to be for 9 billion people on the planet. We're yeah. currently at about 7 billion. How, and I suppose that's part of why you wrote the book, do we work together to really ensure that we don't starve to death, that people aren't dropping off because of lack of water? I mean, this, these are real concerns. Uh, in this system, which again is very interesting, and it's very much what Christ taught also mm. in our culture, uh, is, that, is that unless I provide food to others, unless I help others to get food, then I won't have food myself, mm -hmm. you see? So, so if this is correct, if it's true that the world is planted by what I do to you, then, then I must help other countries to, to feed themselves. Mm -hmm. I must be proactive. I, so there's three choices, right? You can put up walls, mm -hmm. and you can make tariffs, and you can say, we don't want to help anybody else, America first. Mm -hmm. Or, or as a middle way, you can say, well, we'll let them sell things, but only if it's convenient for us. And then the third way is, would you be willing to go out on a limb to help people from another country, especially if you understood that that's the only way your country can be successful? You see what I mean? So How do we start to infuse some of this thought process into our schools? Um, I because I think that's where uh, we really need to start. I, I think it all boils down to successful examples, you mm. see. So there's, there's a habit or a tendency to, to discuss a theory like this, and, you know, academics will discuss it, and, mm. and I think it's important for people to try it, you know. Like, do it, we encourage... H how would somebody try it? I own a small <laughs> business. I live in Missouri, and uh, I own a gas station. What can I, as a gas station owner in Missouri, do to help increase... Uh, you know, the, to help benefit my community, the larger community, the world a, a, at large. Yeah. Um, well, let's say any kind of occupation. Sure. Let's say you want to, you've moved to L.A. and you'd like to be successful as a... Television host. You know, as a television Let's, let's say that. Let's honestly say that because okay. I've helped a lot of actors. I've helped an Academy Award actor. Okay. And uh, actress. And uh, let's say I would like to be successful in a new field. So I've mm -hmm. chosen a, mm -hmm. a different field for my life. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like to be successful in this new field. So you would have the same four steps. Number one, uh, you, it's important to define what you want. So mm. I would like to be, you know, I would like to make this many appearances in the next year okay. as, a, as a talk show host or mm. something like that. Secondly, and this is very counterintuitive for actors and actresses and people in, in show business, you will have to help someone else be successful. Sure, because for me, why would I help you? You're going to take yeah, my yeah, job. Yeah, I'm yeah, going to yeah. be stuck here watching you take my job. <laughs> yeah, and that <laughs> applies to, to the gasoline station sure. owner in the Midwest right, also. Right. So the second step is uh, find someone else mm -hmm. who wants to make it in show business. Mm -hmm. And then third step uh, is to spend one hour a week without pay, mm -hmm. uh, take them to a coffee shop, neutral Ground. Location, sure. And talk to them about how y what they can do to be more successful. And Bounce it's some ideas around, give them some connections, networking, totally, all of that. Yeah. Interesting. And it's very counterintuitive. Mm. You're like, I'm trying to make it in LA. I don't have time to help someone else. Sure. And in this system, you have to sacrifice your time mm. for the other person because it's the only way to be successful. And then you must do Step four. Yeah, without step four, it doesn't work. So step, step four, I really genuinely, though, have to sit there right before I go to sleep. Exactly. And feel the yeah. benefit that I gave to someone else and feel that genuinely going out into their space. It kind of has two steps, this meditation at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. One is, specifically, what did you do to help them mm -hmm. and be happy about what you did? And, 
you know, make some plans for helping them next week, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the second part of that meditation is, I'm trying a new system. Instead of competing with everyone else who mm -hmm. wants to be in show business, I'm actually helping them and spending my time to help them be successful. Mm -hmm. And every word I say, I also hear mm -hmm. in my own ear, and that touches my mind, and that makes an impression, mm -hmm. and that plants a seed, and when you get a break, you know, when someone discovers you, it's not a mistake. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen randomly. Mm -hmm. According to this system, nothing in the world happens by accident. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get your big break and someone's going to discover you on in a coffee shop in, sure. in Hollywood, there's a reason for it. Mm -hmm. And that's that you help someone else. Well, I think you are a, an absolute testament to this philosophy, and I, uh, I really believe that there are many people out there that want to thank the monks in Tibet <laughs> who did decide to send you out into the world <laughs> to help share what it is you yeah, spent yeah. a good portion of your life learning. Uh, mm -hmm. The book, again, is China Love You, The a Death of Global Competition. I would urge you to read this book. Um, it really is uh, to twofold. One, I found it a, a really great introduction to Chinese and just things about China, the way they speak, some of the phonetic uh, parts of their language, uh, some of the thought behind the way they live, uh, but also uh, some very practical tools on how, as Geshe and Michael um, explained to us today, to take the philosophies, the ancient Chinese philosophies, the Ford Seed concept, and to apply that to business in the hopes that we can all win at the yeah. end of the day and, and, and hope for a win-win. Um, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how these next four years play out for the United States. Uh, but I think if, um, if a lot of us do stand up for uh, the policies and the, um, the values that we believe in, yeah. we certainly have the ability to help shape the direction of this company, regardless of how you voted. And yeah. uh, that's, that's our power as, uh, as citizens. Yeah, if we don't, it will be a very tense world mm. for years to come. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a chance to, to go a new way this time. Right, right. Let's see how it goes. I'm one of the lucky ones that got an advanced <laughs> copy of this book. Uh, the book is going to be on sale, publication uh, in February of 2017, so do keep an eye out for that. Uh, Geshe Michael Roach, thank you so very much for being with us. Thank you. For uh, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Uh, and for you at home, thank you for watching. This was a Book Circle Online. Again, I'm your host, Katerina Kazayas. Don't forget that you can watch us via our website, bookcircleonline.com. You can also stream us on YouTube and on iTunes podcasts. So you can get us all day. That was our show. See you again next time. From managing editor Jason Squamata, executive producers Maria Menunos, Phil Svitek, and Kevin Undergaro, we would like to thank you for tuning in to Book Circle Online. For more discussion, go to bookcircleonline.com. And if you have comments, questions, or book title suggestions, write us at info at bookcircleonline.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this is Book Circle Online. BCO, join the circle.